Um, so I'm surprised to see so many people in here to, to talk about PACs. And I've been spending a lot of time last year and a half talking about cybersecurity related to a lot of these devices. So I'm going to kind of do something applied. Did you guys come to the PAC session last year by any chance when we talked about CAC for PACs? Anybody in the room? Is anybody here at administer their PAC system? I'm trying to find out who, who I've got. Are responsible for the network that the PAC system resides on? Just here for CEU credits or just interested in access control? Wow. Sorry? System integrator? Okay. Yeah. You guys use Linnell at your command? Okay. Um, uh, any other other users other than like card holders? Anybody issue badges? Anybody interact with their PAC system at all? Okay. Sure. Okay. Wow. Good. So, um, I'm on, the guy last year, Rodney. We had Rodney Thayer in here last year. A really good cryptographer. Deep, kind of a deep tech talk. I think I'm going to come at this from a much more applied side and give you a little bit of what we've been kicking around in the industry especially with what Underwriter Labs is working on with, with that committee and with SIA and with my committee at uh, PSA Security Network. So I'll, I'm going to give you some of that, but at the end of the day, especially since you guys don't do a lot of PACs, I can promise you're going to learn something new. So stick around for that, okay? Um, I'm going to tell a story about the, what I believe are the sort of insecure times that we're living in. And um, I'm hoping to bring the feeling of that all the way through access control and the things that we can do about that today by the end. Um, I can tell you that at Underwriter Labs, which is UL, right, this is the guys that stamp these products that you buy, they're electrical products or, or network products or whatever, so at UL Cybersecurity Committee, the manufacturers in the room, and I'm not bashing manufacturers, all of them are very concerned about, you know, hardening their products because there's more expense there, there's a lot more time on, on their side to get firmware vetted to get parts out to the market, right? And this is a market of sort of rampant consumerism is where we've been in the IT space. And access control is an IT consumable product. Not, not like Nest necessarily, not that level of consumer, but businesses have consumed it, government has consumed it. And access control along, just like video, has sort of suffered from the, that rapid consumerization. And now we've sort of, the, the pendulum start to swing backwards and uh, at least philosophically towards an idea of, you know, is this stuff really secure? Is this stuff really belong on our networks? So um, we've, I think, you know, I don't think these headlines are going to be anything new to anybody. Um, but in 2009, we suffered, these are just PII, so this is uh, personally identifiable information records uh, that the government lost. So in 2009, we lost 10,000 records. In 2013, it, the number had gone to 25,000. And, and I don't know why it didn't get our attention here. You know, this is a 30% increase just in 2010 in records we lost. And the industry didn't really pay attention. So we get to 2013 with 25,000. And we want to jump forward to like 2014. And I'm sorry the screen's not a little bigger. But what we've got up here is this, this breach that happened at USIS, which sort of lost them their contract. These guys were the guys that sort of do your clearances and do your search. So when you apply for the government to get a clearance, USIS is one of the companies that works on that for the government. Um, they got breached and uh, lost some records. And then there was a, a little test of the OPM system from this breach in which no records were taken. These guys lost their contract and a company called Keypoint got the contract and started working and they got breached. Ultimately, this Keypoint breach is what led to this OPM breach. And I think we lost this is the one where they got my data from my clearance. I think uh, 40 million records total across these two. So 14 and 15. So from you know 2013, you know it was getting bad compared to 2009. Then the next couple of years, we really had a, a big problem. Um, in 2016, this is what I could pull up. I got to working on this last week, and we had uh, for government, we've had another 12 million this year. So from 50 million to 12, we're down a little bit, but basically our personally identifiable information is being stolen at a rapid rate and used by people for nefarious purposes of many kinds. Anybody else here get caught in the OPM breach? I'm sure, look at the hands, love it. All right. So yeah, you guys all got the little portal now that monitors all your stuff and load all your stuff in there too. I get alerts all the time on a lot of different email uh, addresses that I have. Um, so I wanna look at it another way real quick. 
Um, and I call this, you know, you hear IoT all the time, but I call it the Internet of Theft. Um, it's a, I think of a sort of major concern anyway. This, um, maybe it'll come up. I don't know, it's just kind of another way to take a look at this data. Yes. I just tested it, I promise. Well, um, cute. Nice. Lose my presentation here real quick. Just give it a second. Um, yeah, we can just you can just go to after that slide. So, um, PII is going to be important to access control because that's what that CAC card that you've got, that data that's on there, right? Which, which is kind of where I'm driving towards. Um, and, and the interesting thing about these records that the government loses is, is it's not the same, you know, data that a bank that when a bank gets breached or when a healthcare organization gets breached, right? Healthcare records are still going for about 50 bucks. Your PII, depending on who you are, is probably worth a dime, but a bulk of records is worth quite a bit. Your financial inf information, give or take, uh, those don't live very long anymore, so they're not as valuable. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about where those go. So that's good. Um, and I don't know, how many of you guys play around with Tor and Onion browsers and... Yeah, so, so those of you who do know what I'm talking about, and those of you who don't, if you've got clearances, I don't advise you poking around in here without someone that knows you're doing it, uh, just to kind of protect yourself. Um, the data that is being taken is obviously being used in these um, underground markets, and a lot of this stuff is myth. So. A lot of people talk about it and talk about what really exists out there and what doesn't. But you can definitely get, uh, you can find these drop sites. Uh, Docs is gone. You can definitely find uh, the hacker communities and you can definitely find some of these dark net markets where you can advertise stuff that you want to sell or stuff that you want to acquire. Um, and so just some examples for those of you who aren't real familiar with this. The, you know, the, the, web, the web up here is where you all live. Um, and then uh, below that, um, some of these other sites down here, um, you know, College Camps is a good example, um, temporary email services, Reddit. And then b below that, with a, you know, this, this mythical Bergy web, which is kind of just a name for it. But this, this is where the data starts to get a little more uh, nefarious. And below that, where you really need a uh, proxy to get down into the deeper web, into a lot of the sites. And um, this is information that is probably illegal in many cases and you won't really find your data for sale here but below that um, down and down where you get to these um, um, node transfers and down to hacker groups and FTPs and I'm not sure how far I took this um, and then these closed shell proxies which are, are much further down are, are areas that you'll find if you go digging around and this is where your data is being sold at anyway so I want to point out that there's just, just the idea that we see there's vulnerabilities, we see that we're losing data, right? The story I'm trying to tell is that that data is for sale, there's a market ready for it, there's people asking for it, for example, if they want your data, they'll pay so much money to get it. Um, and the cards that we're using also have problems. So as much as we're going to talk about the solution for access control, I want to talk about some of these vulnerabilities first. And um, the social engineering side, this is uh, one of the things that we see, and this is, sorry, the data is not, uh, not too good, but what's important is this high threat here without a, without a countermeasure, and this is for the use of an unreported lost or stolen card, and this is something that we can't control. You know, if you've got this credential and you don't take care of it and you lose it and you don't report that, that's floating around out there, and that's a problem, right, for the thwarting of the system, the, the thwarting of the packs itself. Um, there's some other card-based threats with this use of a terminated card as well. So this threat is very high if we don't go out and, and verify that these cards have certificates that, uh, ha on them that have been revoked, right? So when we go to check the certificates on the cards, 
if it's not been properly terminated and someone's still using it and it was supposed to be terminated, then the card's going to show up as valid. Okay. Um, these are some lower level attacks, skimming and sniffing. And some of these aren't as prevalent with, some, with the newer technology that we're using on the cards. But not all of you are probably using your CAT card on your PAC system. Do you have another card that you use? How many people have a, another card that they use on the card readers to get in, in the facility? In the front door or back door, yeah. So those cards are probably not at the same level of assurance that your, your CAT card is, which is why we've been trying to get to using the, PAC, uh, the CAT card on the PAC systems. Um, let's see what else did I find. So you, again, use of an expired card. So if the system hasn't gone in and someone has not gone and expired that, we've got a, a really high threat there as well, um, especially if somebody's using just visual you know, somebody's looking at it visually and not, not noticing the expiration date, things like that, right? So somebody can gain access very quickly. Um, these other ones, chew it replays, um, trust anchor compromise. These are some sort of like man in the middle type attacks that should be, you know, if you've got the proper encryption stuff running inside your system, it sort of counters these sort of threats. But if you're not doing that, like the legacy pack systems that we're talking about, these problems exist. There was one more high one here that I wanted to get to. Oh, for environmental attack. Yeah, so this is something that we see everywhere we go, um, except for infant abduction systems in hospitals. They seem to be the only guys that are able to get waivers around this. But, you know, you yank the fire alarm and all the doors go open. Right? That's one way to really thwart a, a pack system. Uh, infant abduction areas, we get a waiver from the fire marshal to keep those doors locked for another 30 seconds and things like that. So. This is something that if you're in charge of one of these systems or if it comes to you, which is interesting, there's no one in the room responsible for PACs, but it's one of those things that you want to pay attention to if you have a highly secure area that's important and you don't want to have that, that um, sort of vulnerability just front and center, right? You want to be able to mitigate with a little bit of timing, maybe so you can get a guard response. The, the fire marshal typically will give you 30 seconds. I don't know if I've seen more. Clay, you ever seen much more than that? We've got Clay Estes in the room, by the way. This is a guy that ought to really be giving this talk today, but we didn't know if we'd have him, so I'll get him up here later maybe for you. Um, so we got vulnerabilities. We've got criminal actors. You know, we've got uh, vulnerabilities of our, of our systems, vulnerabilities of our people, right, the things that we do wrong, right, that are out there. So where is this, this promised land that we've been looking for? You know, we're supposed to have this card for security. We're supposed to have secure facilities. So where does this exist, right? And so the government came out. I'm going to need some water. The government gave us um, a mandate. I think I've got the date. It might have been 2002 or something for the HSPD-12, right, for the, to establish a... Um, uh, mandatory, unfunded now, first of all, but mandatory, right? So you got to give funding to these things or they never happen. Government-wide standard for secure and reliable forms of identification. Um, and uh, <coughs> I've got some dates on a lot of this policy and guidance, which was the promised land, right? This was what we, what we needed to get to to mitigate these vulnerabilities and threats that we're talking about. Man, I want to just show you how far back some of this goes to get to the promised land. So PIV also rolled out PIV. Um, it should be pointed out that the personal identity verification stuff was rolled out for the executive branch. Is that, is that correct? And then the rest of us are on, like, so your CAT card is a PIV-I, which is PIV interoperable. And there's also PIV-C, PIV compatible type card. So I just want to point that out real quick. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But PIV, PIV rolled out for us, and then it, so in 04 we had the presidential directive, HSPD-12, and then in, in 2006 we had the actual um, PIV, the card application namespace, so they had to build this data model, it didn't exist, and this was, um, we're on version 74.4 now, which is another NIST instruction, the 800-74, uh, it started in 2006, version 4 was issued in 2015. Um, the 81116, which was the recommendation for using the cards for PACs, came out in 2008. And then the, uh, the PIV stuff itself, 201-1 uh, and 201-2, 201 was 2011 and 2013. 
And then the 140-2, which is all the cryptography stuff, is a little bit older than that. They're on 140-2. It started in 2001. You, Clay, you know when the 1-2 came out? Was it? I, don't, I just don't know offhand. So the government acknowledged early on that we had to do something to, to get it right, right? Because we're, we're – we're, and this is pre a lot of those breaches that we had, by the way, right? So you think about how long ago this, these think tanks at NIST was working on this. And this is, by the way, is part of the Department of Commerce. They work with education to bring technology to government, which is really, really a, a good thing. So it's interesting that it's in the Department of Commerce and it's not, a, not written by DOD, I think. I do have some DOD instruction to share with you later. Um, so the question um, with all of that, uh, all that guidance, right? So we got the promised land guidance. We're going to start writing instructions. We're going to find out which ones work, which ones fail. We're going to write some more instructions. We're going to keep the data flowing. Um, and the magic was in the card. And the magic was really down in these little chips. So I want to point out one thing. You guys probably all have a, a white card, but there are blue and also green cards. I think blue is a um, foreigner and green is contractor. Yeah. So note that if you're ever stuck, you know, one of the first things you should always do if there's somebody, if you're supposed to have a PIV card in your site and you see somebody walking around without one, you want to challenge that person, right? I mean, you, you need to find out if they need to escort back to the front door, or if they need help getting a, a certification to be there on your site. So pay attention that some of these are a bit different anyway. Um, so the data on the card um, was lined out in the, uh, the regs. And um, uh, I just want to read some of the, some of the guidance, okay, because this is a DOD class, so we should keep, stick to the guidance. Um, the CAC is, is meets or exceed applicable privacy law and Geneva Convention requirements. More importantly, the data it stores can only be accessed through secure CAC applications. In fact, the information stored on a CAC cannot be accessed without a PIN number, which is your personal PIN. Don't use the PIN you're using at the bank and everywhere else. Um, um, pin, pin system, the PIN system um, access to the secure CAC, CAC applications required to interpret the data. Uh, it also provides additional security. The card's issued according to sound criteria of personnel identification. It's resistant to identity fraud, tampering, counterfeiting, exploitation, and designed to provide an electronic means of rapid authentication. So if you've used... Has anybody, did anybody say they use CAC at their physical card reader doors? So how long does it take, how long does it take you to get in the door? Just to present, do you use contact or contactless? Okay. Sure. And use a contact and pin, okay. So by the time you enter the pin, so it's about a four or five second delay. So if you're not used to it, if you're used to using procs, and it, it could be three, you know, it just depends. But if you're used, used to using proximity, which is kind of pretty rapid, there's not much data going back and forth, right? But if you're using this CAT card and you're doing some, uh, some cryptography there and passing some encrypted credentials back and forth, it's going to take a little bit longer. So a lot of people can get um, put off by that. Um, so uh, let's see. The card body. The card body contains the PKI certificates, enable the cardholders to sign documents digitally, encrypt and decrypt emails, and establish secure online network connections. I'm sure you're all familiar with doing that, right? That's on your network. Um, there's two digital fingerprints on it. There's a digital photo. There's a PIV certificate. Um, your organizational affiliation, agency department, expiration date. There's also some information on your barcode. Uh, your name, your social security number used to be there, but it was removed in 2012. Date of birth, personnel category, pay category, benefits information. So, and I'm not 100% positive that all the CAC cards that you guys see or use, there's, there's some variants that all of them have data on the MagStripe. Clay, have you seen PIV I cards without data on the MagStripe? To, to be gone too, yeah? Okay. Thanks. That's another good thing. Um, So one of the values of this is that you can release your information using that PIN number, right, at, at rapid sites, right, real-time auto automated personnel identification systems, sites or facilities using the CAC applications. So the, the, the promised land was kind of buried in the technology, and 
uh, this, this chip and what, what we could do with it and, and way we could layer different types of credentials inside there to protect your PII, right? So there's some data out on the edge that we can read the uh, Chewid, which is made up of the FASIN and the agency codes and uh, strings of data. So there are applications out there which we've seen where the card, they're using a CAC card, but they're actually not authenticating the card. They're just reading um, FASIN data off the edge of the card before you know any, any of the other encryption, before any of your PII. And the card does have a, a, a UUID, a unique identifier on that data, so it shouldn't really be allowed to be replicated, um, which is a, one of the things. It's about 16, 16 bits, I think, 16 digits there. Uh, of data agency code and then a unique card code um, and there's other people some people are only passing that little bit and these are I'm talking about system manufacturers right um, which uh, allowed you to sort of get the feel of starting to use that CAC card but you're not really doing any of the authentication that the CAC card allows so um, if your organization decides to start you know to do this or you get involved in a project that's going to have to do this you want to ask what level of authentication they intend to go to um, to, to see if, if it's really going to be uh, full-blown PIVI authentication, or are they just going to use edge data off the card? And I'll talk a little bit about the instruction that covers the, the doing of that. Um, I've got some card pinout data, but I don't think that's really critical here today. So the PKI is a bit of the magic. And PKI infrastructure kind of looks, it looks like this chain of sort of cryptography that it the ultimately allows us to compare a hashed value that we generate against the one that we're supposed to get, okay, at the end of the transaction. And that authenticates that data for us. And I know that that card is valid or that that transaction's valid. So uh, from, uh, this is from FICAM, but the, uh, the PKI is a set of roles, policies, and procedures needed to create, manage, distribute, use, and store, and revoke digital certificates and manage public key encryption. And the purpose of it is to facilitate secure electronic transfer of information for the range of network activities such as e-commerce, internet banking, and confidential email. It's required for activities where simple passwords are an adequate authentication method and more rigorous proof is required to confirm the identity of the parties involved in the comms and to validate the information being transferred. So um, the instruction, and I've got some little bit more instruction stuff to get through. But the federal PKI architecture um, is rooted in this guy here, the federal bridge, so that these guys, when you're going to get your CAC card issued, have certificates that are, they're pulling from the federal bridge, using those certificates that can be the, then authenticated from those commands or from those agencies, um, uh, from, uh, uh, basically from this like, sort of like common root CA. So there are other organizations, I think it's on the next one, there are some other organizations that are using, I see it's on here, so up here where they list um, other bridges, private sector, foreign governments. So there are some other people that allow their certificate lists to be put onto the Federal Bridge. So you can download these, these uh, certificate revocation lists is what you really do. Is you try to go get certificates that are no longer good and compare them against people that are trying to use their certificates on your system. Um, the trust environment, I think SHA-1 is now gone. Uh, SHA is the, let me see if I have that here. So the level of encryption that these guys go to um, for the federal public key infrastructure, entities associated with the federal common policy root CA uh, requires the use of 2048-bit RSA keys or 256-bit elliptic curve keys along with SHA-256 and SHA-384. And I think that is since 2010. CAs are required to use 2048-bit RSA keys or 256-bit elliptic curve keys when signing certificate and CRLs that expire on or after 2010. And they're required to use SHA-256 or SHA-384 when signing certificates that are issued after December 2010. So it looks, uh, so I see, I've got another note. So after 2013, the SHA, all this SHA-21 stuff has gone away. And I believe that we have VA he was here. So these guys have, have moved over. This legacy SHA-1 stuff has all moved over now to a higher level of trust. And so th the reason I'm pointing that out is that the, the transaction time on that 
credential on that card reader is going to take longer. The more encryption we put, we could put mega encryption, but we'll be standing there for 10 seconds trying to get in the door because we've got to transact all that data, right? So that's an issue that the industry has been fighting with as well. Let's see what else I have. Okay, this is the other piece of PIV that a lot of people don't get. And um, there's also a process of issuance, right? So if I accept your passport, your, what do they make you bring? Passport, driver's license, a couple forms of ID, right? I'm the guy there. Um, I do your enrollment. I take your fingerprints. Um, and then when you come back to get the card, I verify all that. So I could be the man in the middle problem. And that's what differentiates PIV from PIVI and PIVC, that process. So in a PIV world, first of all, the ability to get the certificates requested. I think PIVI still works the same way. It's requested by an authorized party to request that you need a credential. And then when you show up, all your data is taken by one party. Then, then vet, it's also vetted at a higher level for PIV than it is for PIVI. And then when you go back to get your card issued, it's issued by a different person. So we, we take a lot of, there's a lot of process steps there that actually ensure the validity of that credential along with all the encryption that goes on it. So a lot of these other ones that you get, do you get, do you guys also get like, do you just use your CAT cards to get in, in base? I guess you don't use like rapid gate and all these other types of, there's a lot of other credentials out there floating around that are, you know, you go to a kiosk and get it made and then you go pick it up from a guy and it's, it's still vetted against your technology. So it's your biometrics get vetted, your pin gets vetted but the back end process for issuing you that card is not near as robust. And it's just subject to a lot of vulnerabilities. So those cards have less trust, basically is what, is what way we should say that. Um, the trust levels are important. And um, I wanna talk a little, just a little bit about the, um, the National Infrastructure Protection Plan. H have you guys heard of this? And do you know where your, the pieces of it fall for you? So DHS set aside 16 segments alongside DOD. Many are regulated. So we have like the, the nuclear environment. We have the healthcare environment. We have the uh, uh, financial environment. And those, um, those sectors are, you, you know about, the, there's a lot of regulations that drive those sectors, right? So there's also a lot of other subsectors. Commercial facilities, for example, is another special subsector under the National Infrastructure Protection Plan. And those facilities, um, cybersecurity is, is listed as one of the issues that they need to address in those facilities, primarily because they house our people. Um, those industries are not currently regulated the way DOD is for PACs and things like this, but they are considered to be in the supply chain of the regulated industries, right? And so what's gonna happen is the same sort of regulatory compliance that's sort of been developed in the DOD space is slowly rolling out into healthcare, slowly rolling out into financial, definitely it's in NERC SIP, which is the nuclear environment. And uh, uh, what, we're, what, what UL is suggesting, what most of the groups that we're, I'm a part of are suggesting is that, that that roll down into those other sectors really based on the National Infrastructure Protection Plan guidance is where we're gonna see this technology that we're talking about today kind of go. It's gonna kind of migrate out. Now, they're gonna be slower adopters. DOD sort of tends to lead the way. But the idea is in time, hopefully, your card that you have, that CAC card will let you in your condo, right? Because they'll be able to go get the DOD CRL if they want, pull down the revocation list and know that that's you. You don't need to have 50 different cards to move around the world when you've got one that's got good enough technology on board. So that's a, uh, how many of you carry multiple cards now at, at, at work? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah, right, so ridiculous, so I know. So that's, that's the point of the shared infrastructure and the federal bridge and all this kind of stuff and, and where we're getting to the, I, I will make a point here eventually. Still trying to tell the story of how we've been developing. Um, okay. So, CAC for PACs. Um, the argument comes from, let's see. I wanted to read this DOD instruction, which is so much fun. Um, 
talk a little bit. So the development for PIV was really done in association with NIST and a group called the Smart Card Alliance. And I just want to want to read some of the so a little bit of the guidance. So um, the reason that you want to put CAC into a PAC system, um, you know, we've got a published credential standard based on open NIST PIV related standards. Um, it's easier for software providers and developers to enable uh, more and more applications to use that credential. Uh, we get identity assurance because we've got the, the, uh, the verification of the PIV, the, proof, the proofing process, the enrollment system. Um, and then entities can use that base level of confirmation as needed. And we also gain economies of scale like I was just talking about. I only really need one card. If I can allow that card to work on my PAC system, if it can work on your PAC system, if I want to accept that level of credential, uh, I gain that economy. Um, fewer, fewer credentials, obviously, and then uh, interoperability. So because we've got that standard out there, it works. Um, currently, we sort of got this, this huge variation in the quality and the security of the forms of identification that are out there. A lot of these cards are subject to very simple replay attacks, and, and especially like the, the cards you have now are 13.56 megahertz, and they are you know, deeply uh, encrypted with cert the certificates are deeply encrypted, whereas the older 125K Hertz cards, which are all over the bases, we work in, in all these spaces, and those cards are really easy to uh, emulate. Um, so, this is some more stuff from the instruction, and this is DOD instruction. It's from March 2nd, 2016. Uh, it outlines the refs for a DOD's what's called their Personal Identity Protection Program, PIP. Um, it, it was a reissue of an, of a, of an older directive. Uh, it established a policy and assigned responsibilities for the DOD PIP program. It established identity protection and management, senior coordinating group people. Again, this is funding to you know, make all this magic happen, right, when they, they made the mandate, but they didn't really fund it very well. Um, Another mandate was sharing identity attributes with DOD asset owners. Um, and then the other thing that, that, that's big as part of this proof of affiliation is, first of all, is if we have cards that should be authenticated uh, via Global Directory Service or PKI, that needs to be done in real time whenever possible. So this is an instruction laying out that this is the way to do this. The other piece is that the authentication user granting logical, this is what you're doing now in your networks, and physical access is a combination of these functions, and, and it, it cites these instructions. So the DOD, as much as they, you know, laid out all this guidance beginning in 04, you know, we're still, it's 12 years later, and they're coming back to another instruction to beg, basically, can you please bring your systems up to the standard that we've laid out? Um, and we're going to talk about how that's actually doable today. Let's talk a little bit about why. So, <clears throat> to make this story come true, we had to take that technology and apply it to our facilities. Um, and the good thing about CAC is we could meet any assurance level. So, if we just wanted to read that FASTIN, which is that code I talked about before I've ever put in my pen or looked at any biometrics, um, I could definitely use this for an uncontrolled space, you know, maybe the front door, walking into the lobby, walking into the um, quarter deck. Um, um, and it, it may secure, at least it knows, I, I can tell that that card's not been revoked. Um, to go further into controlled spaces, I can use the, uh, the, the CHUID, which is the full thing, and, a, and a, uh, the, this is the full code, and the, uh, the visual check. Um, but I've still got the possibility that that's been copied, cloned, lost, stolen, or it's a shared, you know, someone's taken that credential. Um, I can also use the cake, um, and I get a little bit more protection, but not against it being lost, stolen, or shared. And then if I start using PIV plus PIN, now I've, got, I've added that something I know to it, so I get a little bit more assurance, and I can maybe go to a limited space with that. And then an exclusion area like a skiff. I really got PIV plus PIN plus bio, which I think you talked about in, in your spaces. So it allows us to do uh, a, a quite a bit of different assurance levels, and the reason we want to do that is we don't want to apply this highest level of assurance to the very front door, because it's expensive, and it's slow. So, um, with the four assurance levels, and I want to, this may be a little convoluted, I think we're fair on time. What, is this till 15, or is it till, is it one hour? Okay. Um,
So the fundamental premise of ICAM is that only trusted authentication factors are used, right? So there needs to be, a, we need to categorize that assurance, which you've seen here. Um, the CHUD incorporates the signature checking option, which results in one trusted authentication factor. And the BIO incorporates the signature checking option, which results in one trusted authentication factor. Um, the BIO A is not shown. Um, uh, I just had that there's no good direction for using that. Um, the assurance achieved at the door shouldn't be greater than the assurance validated at the registration to the PAC system, right? And cake is an option, but it also, the, this cake may not be, the cake I had on the prior one may not be present on all cards. Do you know when, when that's not available? Is that just a choice of the command when you see, don't see a cake? Okay. Um, uh, all right. So where, do we, where are we going to do this at? So when we've got a facility and we've got to move people from unrestricted access to controlled access to limited to exclusion, right? Uh, I've got those, these types of authentication that I just talked about. And so this is a, a way that you can look at mapping this up. And if you don't sort of have this responsibility, it might not uh, be that important to you today. But understand that there's value behind it because I've got cost savings out here where I've got, you know, re re uh, uh, entry into a restricted or, control or an unrestricted or controlled space. And I've got more cost when I've got to add this biometric and even more cost when I've got to go up here and do three factors of authentication, something you know, something you have, and something you are. And on a map uh, of a facility, so this is like looking at a facility from the outside and mapping these authentication mechanisms to gain access to an area. Um, and so this is from FICAM. This is the sort of way you design a system and its requirements, right? So there's not, it's not like a mystery. It's not like, why do I apply what? Or you got the commander says, I want everything as secure as possible. It's like, well, that's not, that's not really guidance. You know, it's really too expensive and it's really too slow. Um, so based on the level of assurance that you require, right, based on the type of data you've got in that space and the type of access needed, you've got a way to map an assurance level based on that CAC card. This is not something we had with the older proximity type cards in the uh, legacy pack system. Oh, that showed up great. I'm sorry. Cake, what is the cake? C-A-K, it's the card authentication key, yeah. So that's just, uh, it's just a, another wrapper on the outside, but they, again, they don't, they don't all have the cake on it. And this, um, by the way, this, show, this slide package, all my notes are, they're much more detailed than what I'm talking about. They're all on there. The links to all this, this, this uh, FICAM and all the cert, the cert information and this information is all on the notes. So if they, do they release these to them? If, if not, I'll give you my card or at the end, you can, you can have all this data. It's good stuff if you get stuck having to work on this. Um, and it is, in, it is individual per facility, right, and per requirement you can see. So there's a lot of customization available. Um, unfortunately, this is a cool chart. Um, what... You can't see it. That's how cool it is. No. Um, so uh, what this is, um, I've got patterns with no factors. So viz, chew it. I can see that I've got an interface, which is contact or contactless. So these can be contact where you have to stick them into the reader or contactless. Some of the technology is available contactless, right? But that's not going to be your most secure. Um, and then um, I've got the authenticators for it that work, right? So I've got the patterns with one factor, patterns with two factor, patterns with three factors. The type of authenticator, so this is something I have, something I have, something I am, something I know. And you see have plus R, have plus no. And these all map, and what these are, those mitigate, those um, um, vulnerabilities that I had up earlier. So this also, you know, addresses like certain types of vulnerabilities that you maybe can't live with. So this is a good chart to have. Anyway, I'll make sure you get this. Uh, and then does it meet, meet the HSPD 12 requirement? And then does it have examples in the, the NIST 116, right? So... Because uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, examples laid out in there for how to deploy this technology on your facility, right? So the guidance is very specific. And if you do it the right way, and it's doable the right way now, and we'll talk about that uh, just a little bit. Something you have is the card, and something you are would be the biometric, and something you know would be your PIN. Yeah, and so that's considered to be the best form of, auth of authentication. So you'll see that at a skiff, right? You're going you're gonna to use all three. So, um, for those of you who get saddled with a project like this, you've got to, in order to migrate from the packs that you have now, right, to something that's going to use a, a, a secure packs, use CAC for packs, um, 
you're going to have to have some input from a risk assessment. You know, d just like any business does, you're going to have to go out and take a look. You're going to have to survey the facility. You're going to have to define these rooms and spaces and areas that you need to understand what level of authentication that you need to get in. Because you've got the card, right? But you're going to have to do some work in hardware. Um, Probably not wiring uh, in most cases, but um, definitely in the hardware. And then, you know, you select your authentication me uh, mechanisms, um, pick a solution. There's a lot of different hardware providers, and I'll share that with you. Um, and then you develop your migration plan and get, you know, get to work on it. Um, your typical access control system sort of looks like this today. You know, you've got administrator uh, software talking to the head end. The head end's got access control panels, which got door controllers, and that's controlling the access at the door and the card reader, and you've got a card down here of some type. Your new system, um, and this, I, I found this a little lacking. This came out of FICAM, but there's a, there's, what's missing here is the cloud connection to that federal bridge, okay? So this panel right here today, you see they wrote the new PKI security controls in here, but this panel actually talks out via the internet to the federal bridge. Okay, because it has to download those certificate revocation lists, right? So that if you've been deleted, if you've been, what do you call it, removed or, or uh, fired or terminated or whatever, if your, your credentials no longer good, um, there's guidance as to how long they have to put that up in, into the uh, certificate revocation list bank. And then if I'm pulling them down and you come to the door or come to the door, that um, query from that reader to that controller is going to understand that that certificate on your card's been revoked and it's not gonna allow you access any longer. So that's just a, still something that's missing on the model here. Um, sort of a, a better way to look at it is that the PAC server sits here in the middle and this is a, a also this is out of the FICAM roadmap. So here's your PAC server, your cardholder database and all your peripherals. Here's that certificate, that federal certificate authority that we talked about. And then the field components are also pulling data from that. This is where that, that CRL, that certificate revocation list I'm talking about is loaded into that field component. Um, and it is also a part of obviously your overall security management system. And there may also be external interfaces and, and there's an authoritative source for where that card got issued from as well, right? And then you may even have a visitor management system that you wanna check uh, your visitors with. So the uh, FICAM guidance is good. Um, this is what the architecture looked like until very recently. So I had this federal bridge talking down to the uh, PIV authentication hardware, which was that panel, and then a PIV certificate manager, and then that was talking to my PAX hardware. And then the card reader was also talking back up here to check the CRLs on the card. So a little bit more of a convoluted path than we have available today. today Oy, okay, well, let me show you. So this is the older hardware. So we had this panel here. This was the guy that was the extra piece that we needed. This was a reader you could just read card only, um, or you could have card plus pin, and you've probably seen these on your walls, and then card plus pin plus biometrics. That look familiar? To, yeah. So very standard HID makes this for everybody in the world. I think they sell 99% of the stuff that's out there. Uh, but today what we can do um, is the Federal Bridge can talk directly to that PAX hardware and then directly to the PAC software and the certificate manager. And so this lets us do that authentication that we need in a, in a much uh, simpler way. And this, this hardware um, came out from a company called Mercury. They supply hardware to about 20, 25 or 30 different software manufacturers out there. So it's not, it's not an ad for Mercury or anything. Um, they're just the first guys to get this done without using that other secondary piece of hardware that you needed. Um, and that, that, all that magic sort of lives in this little daughter board that you see on here. It's a, a separate Linux-based controller. Um, let's see if I got more of that. Yeah, the other thing that we did or that was achieved with this panel um, was downstream to the card reader. So step one, I'm able to pull CRLs onto the panel directly to authenticate cards with, right? That was a great step. I lost a piece of hardware, saves money. The other thing, we, we still had a problem in, in PAC systems is that downstream where I connected that reader, I had a, um, a uh, insecure backbone talking between the reader and the controller itself. It used a protocol called Wagand. Wagand can be easily taken right off the wire. There's nothing to it, there's no encryption. There was nothing happening there until this year in physical access control systems, okay? 
So the working group that we have at SIA has a protocol called OSDP, which got introduced V1 last year, I think, V2 this year, Clay, is that correct? V2 last year, and now we're doing, and secure is, secure is V2 or V3? V2. So what we gained with V2 was the ability to do um, TLS 1.2 encryption, which is the highest level of encryption that we currently have over OSDP, which is this new protocol that they built. So I get bi-directional communications back out to the reader. It used to only be one way. So between the reader and the controller, I've now got encrypted communications and they're bi-directional. So if I need to do something, if I need to change a, the, the way the reader's functioning, perhaps I can do that now from the controller. And maybe it, I'm gonna allow you to come in and just use your single factor authentication at my front door from eight to five, but at five o'clock, I'm gonna switch it and ask for your pin. So I can do some things like that. And um, I can also change, I can push like different reader lights, other, other types of functionality back out to that reader. And also I can upgrade that firmware. There's some other, other things I gain by being, to, being able to talk bi-directionally to that reader that we didn't have in the past. So I, th I think we'll see more development on that. It, it's just come out. Um, and OSDP, which is what I was talking about, this Open Supervised Device Protocol, which is new. There's a, a document in here that you'll get with this package. Um, that talks about the, um, the review that the DOD did and the ap applicability uh, for OSDP. Um, and so we gained, obviously, the uh, bidirectional communication. We gained a ton more packet size. Um, and we gained multi-drop support, uh, which is kind of good from a cabling perspective. Um, we also, in a review of the protocols, the, the DOD was able to pick out you know, the, the way that they were going to apply under FIPS 201-2 the types of authentication mechanisms that, we, mechanisms that we could use with the CAC card on that panel. Um, and then I also point out they, they, there's uh, several vendors that are, that are using OSDP. Not all are using secure OSDP, which is the TLS version, which is what you want to uh, uh, use um, if you get you know, in, in a project that requires this. And there are some other, some little interface boards being built now that actually convert WAGAN to um, OSDP. But again, these won't provide you with secure OSDP. So we've got what I got, about 15, 10 minutes. So um, Clay, I was going to ask, um, Clay Estes does uh, a ton of this work for the DOD. And he's here. You've got a booth. What booth? Do you know what booth you're at? What number? Booth 1000. If you want to go see this or see how it works, that's all set up. Um, Clay's not a sales guy, he's an engineer, so he won't, he, he won't sell you anything, but he'll definitely walk you through the, the, the details. What, um, what limitations do you think, um, or have you seen with people trying to move from CAC to PACs now? I know we had a little bit of a power, the, the readers needed more power and some of that kind of stuff. Could you talk about some of the implementation challenges? Yeah, it's almost like a, it's not. It's it's like lay it on there, so that's something to, to be considered. <laughs> yeah. So if you're you know if you're if you're trying to use that contactless. Uh, credential on that reader, right? And you want to just go up and hit the reader and go through, um, and you've, you've destroyed it. We had uh, an Army command that's very diff rough on their cards. I think 40% of them had broken antennas, right? So they're like, my car doesn't work, my car doesn't work. They stick it in the computer, it works on the network, but doesn't work on the reader. And that's because that antenna had gotten broken. So um, where are we at with media? Do you know, I know, I know you're not a, the, the media itself, the cards, is there a, was there any, any, uh, has there been any work to bulk those up a little bit, or? Okay. So some of the, 
you know, they typically will give you that nice plastic holder, which is kind of heavy and you don't like hauling it around, but it will protect the card. So if your command or someplace you're going to have to go is going to start to use your cat card for packs, you're going to want to make sure it's not damaged or, you're, you know, if you're, if you're a person that th throws it around. I, I don't know what these Army guys do, there, but they have a very high failure rate on their cards. So uh, that was, it was a, quite a headache to get an implementation done up there. Yes? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it circles the card. Let's see, how far back was that? Not too far. Yeah, maybe right there. So here's the antenna here. You can see it wrapping around the edges. Yeah. And so what's getting broken are these little guys here, the little bitty, the little leads that go to the chip. I'm guessing. I think this stuff's probably holding up pretty well. We can't open them up and, and see what's broken, but we can tell that it's broken. The, um, um, the durability factor, I don't think, was a, a real, a necessarily a consideration, you know what I mean? But it, in, in the real world, it becomes a problem, and we definitely experience that ourselves. Do you get a lot of breakage up on your site? Is everybody, are they rough guys or easy going? Okay. Hmm. Is, is your card feel thicker, do you know? Is it? Okay. 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 So it seems like you know that this this lot of stuff has finally started to roll out. And again, there's I think there's still how many how many versions of CAC are out there? Car, the cards. I mean, there's there's several flavors. You know, it just depends on where you go. There's three. Okay. Good. So that's that's come down quite a bit anyway. Other questions or anybody? Um, yes. Okay. 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 Sure. The, the good thing about that is that's a, a 10 cent card, right? I can print that on just a piece of vinyl so I don't have to spend the money on a CAT card or on a, on a card with any technology in it and use it. So that's how. Uh, I see mo you know, most people are happy to get away from, they still want to print something that they can use and stick it in the slot if they can and breaks the little tabs off the slot and all that kind of stuff. But it's, um, it, it's what you're left to. And we may be left to that for a while because they really didn't bring up anything other than foreigner or contractor, right, with the striping. And so that is a bit of an issue. And I don't, have you, I know you, you sit on this. Have you heard any, is there anybody, are they going to address any, that any further? Or is there just too many in command individual commands and requirements that, you know, the cards would look crazy? Mm. So, no, no help for visual. Maybe you know we're all gonna, we're all being. Ah. But if you go full cack, then you're gonna need to you're gonna need to put another credential on them. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is part of that part of that setup for control, right? How, how are you going to manage that identity? How are you going to how are you going to understand who that person is? Um, it's good feedback, I think. Anyway, yeah, same problem you guys have had, just for visual identification. It's one of the first first things we teach, right? I, th I talked about that when I first started today, right? You know, if somebody's supposed to have a card on and they don't, or it doesn't match what you're supposed to be, you need to challenge them. That's one of the reasons we wear the card. So, but I see your point. If somebody's not got something that differentiates them by area that's easily visible, you know. Of course, you shouldn't allow tailgating either. That's the one thing you, you know, you have to stop and say, "Excuse me, you're not allowed," <laughs> you know. Or you put in unit with turnstiles and all that kind of stuff. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, on which network? 
No, so, so the OCSPs, responders, no, you can, it's, it's a web portal. So as long as, it, long as it can get out and see the web, you can pull the CRLs down. Yeah, it doesn't need to. Um, in fact, there's a, a you, Clay's probably put some of these on, on Zipper or Nipper or something, but we haven't deployed any out here on that. And you, although those guys, they have it because they have to issue credentials. Like when you go to Paycom, you can get your card made. So it's, to me, like we ought to be able to do it. I think they don't trust our, the actual panel. So the, there's a couple other things going on with the panel and with this, the, this IoT problem that you hear about, right? And that's that, that network interface card um, on, this, on this board. Got time? Um, uh, yeah. Here. So this is the guy that I plug in to the network, right? And so what happened in our industry, and this is n no doubt the truth, we used to do RS-485, RS-232. So access control systems lived on phone lines and serial modems for years, right? So then somebody said, can we do it on the network? So a company called Lantronics built us a nice little IP to 485 converter, right? And everybody went nuts. Woo, let's deliver all the apps over the WAN and let's give, it, give them what they want. And it looked like a miracle from a security physical security perspective, right? The problem was those guys didn't give a damn about security on that. Uh, they didn't care about the IEE spec, right? They just wanted to sell stuff. And so this is what I'm talking about, that move from consumerization back to cybersecurity. And this is why UL's finally gotten involved. So this particular device runs a AES-128 or 256-bit encryption right here, which meets FIPS 140-2. So it meets the standard for the encryption. So this guy can go on your network um, this is how this we just got these this this quarter uh, are in manufacturing are they how long have they been available play not that long right from mercury first of the year so so there is did they vet the OSDP and all that or that was been a little more recent the the secure OSDP so um, it's truly like this is I now can tell someone I have a secure way to give you an access control system I don't talk to them about video yet it's still a mess Okay, and, and that's why I was talking about earlier in UL, you know, in that, that working group, you know, those manufacturers, they, they make a, you know, Tyco's like, I make a thousand cameras. I'm like, give us one good one. I don't need a thousand. I need one that I can secure, one that can support TLS 1.2, which is transport layer security with the right amount of encryption that we need, or AES 128, something that I can put on a network that, that I can, that I know is secure. And, um, that's a chipset issue, right? They didn't just go buy the best chipsets to put in all those devices. They bought the cheapest chipsets. Those chipsets won't support that stuff. So we're a ways away. And, and UL is going at this from the firmware perspective. You gotta understand that all these devices, this device, cameras, all these IoT devices have firmware. Well, most of the manufacturers are supporting all kinds of pieces of firmware, all kinds of different versions of firmware. So now, if I have to go get a keep supporting all of that firmware and get it vetted by UL, I've got a cost every time. And every time I've got a vulnerability or every time I've got to make an update to it, I've got to run it back through their process again, which is about a six week process. It's not started yet. This is all in, we're in the third comment period at Underwriter Labs now, so, but soon. But the, the firmware is more the issue. The hardware, I think we can kind of harden up with just some, some chip improvements, but the firmware is going to be a bigger issue and then me being able to give you a certificate saying this firmware on this device is certified um, you know by UL because that series 2900 is what's going to be requested out of regulated industries first DOD first regulate industries and then all those supply chains and other NIP sectors that I was talking about so that's sort of the flow down five years from now ten years from now don't know when we'll be implementing all of this as a requirement there's a lot of hardening guys coming out for a lot of these types of devices now from physical security manufacturers. Well, a lot, there's six. Um, but start to ask for this kind of stuff. If it, if it comes your way or if it falls within your domain, um, ask the vendor, he'll ask the manufacturer and you gotta play the game until we've got a little bit more guidance you know, from UL, which is who we're looking to on the product side. You've still got peoples and pro people and processes to take care of in your organization. Other questions? Yes, sir. For mo uh, mobile, yeah, or yeah, on a phone. Sure, yeah, I'm passing that credential. So the you know there's uh, there's Bluetooth. What's the other one? I know they're using BLE. 
a Legion and there's, yeah, NFC, right? So there's two, two different ways to handle that transaction, right? And so, yeah. Sure. So, so well, I think I think for packs, right? They're just they're just now able to handle a transaction that's got some cryptography out there on the end of it and do it by directly and, and add additional query, right? If it doesn't like what it got or if it you've raised the the threat level, maybe you want to ask for something else additional, right? So, um, out to a mobile device, having I've, there's a lot of mobile devices, mobile device credentials, but there's none at, at with this level of assurance, if that makes sense. Yeah. Sure. And they may have it, but you know we don't have it. The, the most advanced stuff's happening. Uh, Lawrence Livermore and the guys that are doing all of our, and they they actually make their very own panels. No one else ever gets them. They make their own protocols. No one else uses them. So that's that's as off the grid as it gets. The guy that was here last year giving this session, Rodney Thayer, is a, a part of that development. They've they've had the same stuff for like 20 years, and they're retooling now. So maybe maybe we'll get him back next year and have him give, tell us what he can. I don't know how you know what all I can say. Other questions? Did everybody learn something new? That's all I promised. All right. Great. Thank you.